all places to the most high. So tonight's topic is called the duty of marriage. That's tonight's topic. The duty of marriage. Okay. All praises to the Lord. All praises to the Lord. Um, let's open up with the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. We're going to get to the point. Let's start. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and, and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall and they too shall be one flesh. You see that the apostle Paul is quoting Christ, he is quoting Adam. Okay, this is for this cause. Shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, not children, and they too shall be one flesh. Hmm. Let's get that in Genesis 2. Get that in Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Man shall leave his father and his mother, and cleave unto his wife, or join unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Okay, now what I'm saying, I'm going to Ephesians. First of all, he's going to our former Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31 For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined there to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. But the Apostle Paul is letting us know he says this marriage is a mystery. Marriage is a mystery concerning Christ and the church. Let's get the case. Get that in first chronicles. Okay. Let's get that first. First chronicles chapter 3, verse 8. Read that. First Chronicles chapter 8, verse 30. Please read the verse, sir. Mm. Shalom, sir. Yes, I'm struggling to hear leadership. Uh, let's take it to again. Ephesians 5 verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You understand? Many is a great mystery between Christ and the church. So let's see who the church is. Get that in First Chronicles. Chapter 28, verse 8. Let's see who is the church. Okay, come on. First Chronicles 28, verse 8. Now therefore, mm. in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord. See that thing? In the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord. So Israel, we are the congregation of the Lord. We are the church of the Lord. Okay, get that in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, the 38, let's start there. Come on. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. He brought them out. Verse 38. This is he. That was in the church in the wilderness, with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us. But now he says, when he says, "This is he that was in the church in the wilderness," 
the he that was in the church in the, in the wilderness is who? Jump up to verse 37. Let's see who he's talking about. Okay, come on. Verse 37. This mm -hmm. is that Moses, who said unto the children of Israel, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear. You see that? He says, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel. Because Moses was the one that was in the church in the wilderness. So who was Moses in the wilderness with? Moses was in the wilderness with the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. When he led us out of Egypt, okay, with the mighty hand through the most high God. Get that into John 1 and 1. Read that for me real quick. You're right, Mr. One, this one. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness. You see that? So Moses was with the 12 tribes of in the wilderness. Okay, so the church is the 12 tribes of Israel. Get that in Psalm 74, verse 2 now. Let's get there. Let's get some more on it. Okay. Psalm 74, verse 2. Come on. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the mm -hmm. rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed. This Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. Is this that thing? The congregation of the Lord, which the Lord purchased of old, is Mount Zion. So Zion is another name for what? Israel. Israel. Give that in First Kings chapter eight and one. Okay. This Mount Zion. We're in the world. That's the four tribes of Israel. Get that in First Kings chapter eight verse one. First Kings chapter eight verse one. Come then on. Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, and all the heads of the tribes, the mm. chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, and to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. You see that Israel, Jerusalem, which is Zion. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32 now again. Now we have, a better, we have a better understanding of who the church is. Come on. Ephesians 5, verse 32. Come on. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. This mm. is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Marriage is a great mystery which concerns Christ and the 12 tribes of Israel, the congregation of the Lord. Come on. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and mm -hmm. the wife see that she reverence her husband. This part like it says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, meaning the men, so love his wife even as himself. Now watch this. You see this part right here when he says we must love our wives even as ourselves. What law is this? Give me that in Ephesians 19, verse 17. Let's see the law has been, been referenced here. You must love your wife even as yourself. Okay, read that. Leviticus 19, verse 17. Come on. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Mm. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Come on. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because your wife is your neighbor. Your wife is your neighbor. So when it says love your neighbor as yourself, that includes your wife as well. Okay? So go back to where you was at. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. is Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and mm -hmm. the wife see that she reverence her husband. You see that thing? So it says, love your wife even as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law that Apostle James is making reference to. Get that in James chapter 2. Okay, James chapter 2 is 8. Let's read that. James chapter 2 is 8. Mm -hmm. He fulfilled the royal law according to the scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. 
it fulfills the royal law according to the scripture. The scripture we just read in the 19th chapter. Okay, come on. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. See that you love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. You love your wife even as yourself. You do well. Okay? Now, watch this. Give me the book of Ephesians chapter 5 now, verse 25. I'm going to jump up to verse 25. Watch this. It says what? It says, men must love their wives even as themselves. Okay, watch this. Verse 25. Read that. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Mm. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Come on, read the verse again. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, mm. love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. So now it says, husbands, love your wife, even in the same way as Christ also loved the church. That word, even so, means the same way as Christ also loved the church. And it is what word? Come on, okay, read this again. Come on, stay with me. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Come on. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Hold on. That last, read the verse again because you're skipping stuff. Read verse 25 again. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands. Hey. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church mm -hmm. and gave himself for it. And gave himself for it. Gave himself for it. So now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time here, okay? Is as husbands love wives, even as Christ also loved the church. So I'm going to deal with that, how Christ loved the church. Give me the book of Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Mark 6, verse 34. Watch this. Mark 6, verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were because they were as sheep. Wait, wait, wait. It is that Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them. He was moved with compassion towards the people. Which people is this? The people of Israel. His people. Okay. Read the part again, verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. You see that? He says, because there was a sheep without a shepherd. Why? Because the way Christ loved the church, what did he do? He took care of us. You understand? He taught us. He fed us. And the same way Christ took care of the church is the same way the husbands must take care of their wives because your church became in your house. You must have compassion towards your wife. You have to have compassion towards each other. That's what the Lord is saying right here. You understand? Read again, read again, verse 34. I want this verse to hit home. Come on. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And Pray. Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began mm. to teach them many things. I think so. As Christ... You understand? He is our shepherd. He was he's the chief shepherd over us because he was moved with compassion when we didn't have no shepherd. Just it's the same way in the house. When, it's, when a woman does not have a husband, she's like a sheep without a shepherd. When a sister does not have a hedge over her, whether it's a father, the elders in the church, she's like a sheep without no shepherd. It's the same thing. Jump down to verse 37. Come on. Verse 37. 
He answered and said unto them, Give ye, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? So now he came to the disciples. Okay, go ahead. Watch this. He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. So there's five and two fishes. Okay, five loaves and two fishes. Come on. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies unto the green upon the green grass. But the people that was the people that he was moved with compassion. <laughs> and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Great meaning it was order because Christ established order. He said the church in order. Come on. And when he had taken five, the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up unto heaven and blessed and break the load and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. But the two fishes divided he among them all. You understand? So guess what? He broke bread and he divided the fish, the two fishes among them all. Meaning he was taking care of the people. He was feeding the flock. Come on. And they did all eat and were filled. They did all eat and were filled. So guess what? Nobody had left when Christ walked the earth. He took care of the church. Rick? And they took up the 12 baskets full of the fragments of the fig tree. Read that again, verse 43. Mark chapter 6, verse 43. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Now he says they took up 12 baskets. The 12 baskets represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Full of fragments and of the fishes. Come on, fragments of bread that he broke for them. Come on. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. You see that thing? So the point is, Christ took care of the church. This is going into a parable, but it's also explaining that Christ took care of the church. You understand? He was looking after the people. So likewise, the husbands you take care of your wives. That's what the Bible is saying right here. You understand? The same way Christ took care of us and gave his life for us, we must do the same thing for our wives. Understand that thing. Now watch this. Um, give me John chapter 5 verse 8. John chapter 5. John 5 verse 8. You understand? He was feeding the people. He was healing the people. John chapter 5 verse 8. Come on. John chapter 5 verse 8. Jesus mm -hmm. said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Because this man could not walk. He says, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Come on. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. He was healing on the Sabbath day because it is lawful to do when on the Sabbath day. Go ahead. <laughs> The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured. That it was is what? the Sabbath day. That was cured. Cured with word. Yes, this is the thing. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured with his word, with the word that Christ spoke unto him. Come on. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. You see what they were saying? They did not look at the miracle Christ performed to heal that man that could not walk. But they were trying to find something to use. They said, listen, it was not lawful for you or you to carry your bed. The man wasn't working. And it's this. He wasn't working. You understand? He carried his bed back home. Because why? He could not walk. So now he could. So he carried his bed to use it. He got his legs back. Come on. He answered them. He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. The same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Ray. Then asked they him, What man is this which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? Mm. And he that was healed was not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in the place. After Christ healed the man, he left. 
after he healed the man, he left. What was this? Come on. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now Christ met this man that he healed afterwards when they were just the two of them in the temple. He says, What? Behold, he says, Behold, thou art made whole, meaning he was healed. Say no more, meaning don't break the laws anymore, let the worst thing come unto thee. So, what is he telling him? Listen, Christ was teaching the laws. So, you understand, he was healing the people and teaching the people not to sin anymore, but to repent. That's what he was doing. So, not only was he healing the people, but he was healing the people as well. You understand? Get that John 8. Verse. Yes, sir. John chapter 8, verse 4. Come on. John chapter 8, verse 4. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. I Means she was caught. You understand? She was caught in the very act. Bumping and grinding. But watch this whole thing. Get that into chapter 22, verse 22. But she wasn't bumping and grinding by herself. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 23 If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto his hu and husband and no, no, the no, man no. find Hold on, Deuteronomy 22 verse 22 Deuteronomy 22 22 Read that Excuse me sir Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 22 If a man be found lying with a woman Married to an husband, what? then they shall both, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman, and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. You see what he's saying is as if the man be found lying with the woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So this woman was not caught, she was not caught in adultery by herself. She was what? She was having sex with this little man. She was not by herself. Okay, so go back. John verse 4. Read that again. John chapter 8, verse 4. Mm. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. In the very act, in the court, she was following the popsicle. Go ahead. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? John chapter 8 verse 2. And early in the morning, verse 3, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, so the scribes and Pharisees they brought a woman unto Christ who was taken in adultery, meaning in the very act. Okay, now read verse five now again. Verse five. Now Moses mm -hmm. in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? See, I think so. What, what's going on here is what is not a just judgment that they are making here. Why? Because they only took the woman. Now and they want to condemn the woman. They are not. They don't want to condemn the men as well. Like we read in John twenty-two twenty-two, because this woman was not by herself committing this act. She was committing this act with this man. You understand? So now they are saying we know that Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what says that? What do you say, Christ? That's what they are asking. Go ahead. This they said, tempting him. See that thing? They were tempting him, trying to get something out of his mouth. Read. That they might have to accuse him. Mm. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had, as though he heard them not. So now speaking to Christ like this, he says he stooped down and with his finger he started to write down on the ground, on the sand. Go ahead. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. You see what, you see what he said to them? 
is that he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at the head. You see what he's doing now? Remember, he's writing down, and then he begins to speak. Go ahead. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. He did what? And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So he continued to write down as they are talking. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the lost. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 9 again. Read verse 9 again. John chapter 8, verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. Hold on. It says, they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. What do convict your conscience? What do convict your conscience? Watch this. Give me the book of John 7. Okay, you know what? Give me Hebrews 9. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9. Read verse 14. Hebrews 9 verse 14. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Mm -hmm. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. To purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Purge your conscience from dead works. The dead works goes into what? The law of animal sacrifice, it also goes into our sins. The dead works to serve the living God. But we don't do that. We was to purge our conscience from dead works. Watch this. Give me that in that first Peter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Let's read verse 21. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 21. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Mm -hmm. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But the mm. answer of a good conscience toward God the by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, but the answer of the what now? Resurrection. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. The answer of a good conscience toward God. The answer of a good conscience towards God. How do we have a good conscience towards God? What is the what makes our conscience to be good? Let that be wrong with seven is top. But the answer of a good conscience to seven is top. You can understand what convicted their conscience. What was convicted their conscience as Christ was like? Romans chapter 7 verse 12. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. So what is good is the law. What is good is the commandment and they are just. You understand? So Romans chapter 7 verse 25 now. Watch this. Because your conscience is in your mind, in your brain. Where your conscience is in your mind, you understand? So for you to have a good conscience, you need God's commandments. And where is your conscience at? In your mind. Now read what you got. Romans 7 verse 25. Romans 7 verse 25. Mm. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Mm. But with the flesh, the law of sin. And with the mind, I myself set the law of God. So we set the laws of God with our mind. That's where our conscience is. To pay our conscience from death back so we can see that we serve the living God. So go back to John the 8th chapter again. John 8. Let's read that now. John chapter 8. 
John chapter 8, verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the end. So it says, when they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, because you get to think about it. What God was translating down that convicted them in their own conscience, the laws, the commandments of the Most High God. They say that they were in the midst of using the commandments of the laws. But using God's commandments, writing them down, the sins that they were in, and they were convicted in their conscience. That's why they decided to leave one by one. Because he said to them in verse 7 here. John chapter 7, verse 7. John chapter 8, verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. See that thing? So now, as he was writing down as they were talking, guess what? They started to be convicted in their spirit, in their conscience. Why? Because he was writing down the laws of the Most High God. And they were being convicted. They started to live one by one. Okay, give us that again. John chapter 8, verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now Christ was left alone, the woman now. Listen to what he said. Come on. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Where are you? Okay. Hath no man condemned thee? Right? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You see what he's saying? He says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So what was Christ teaching here? Grace. He was teaching grace. He extended grace. He was telling them, listen, um, get them in John 1 to 17. Let me not push it. Christ was teaching Read that. John chapter 1 to 17. John chapter 1 to 17. Mm -hmm. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Because what does grace teach us? What is the purpose of grace? Before we get there, let's get into the fourth chapter. James chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Watch this. James chapter 4, verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria. Which is called James, Sychar. Not John. James 4 verse 5. Excuse me, sir. James chapter 4 verse 5. Do ye think that the scripture say it in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us lasted to envy? You see that? So the spirit that dwelt within us, it lasted to envy. Because the spirit that dwelt within us, they last to end the end the, the things that the world um, is advertised. You understand? The spirit of that that's in us last to end. Watch this. That's the spirit that dwells in us. The spirit that dwells in us is contrary to God's laws. It's because what the spirit that dwells in us is last to end to fulfill the last of our flesh. Watch this. Get that in Romans chapter 7. Hmm. Now watch this. Get the Galatians five read sixteen. Galatians chapter five is sixteen. Mm -hmm. This I say then: Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The walk in the Spirit, the commandments, and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Come on. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the thing? spirit against the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit. So the spirit that is in us is to end. 
are in us, they are always want to go contrary to what the Bible says, which is for us to go against the spirit, the spirit of the Most High God that's supposed to dwell within us. So there's a constant war within us. The flesh is always fighting against the spirit. That's what the Apostle James is saying, right? And the spirit against the flesh. Mm -hmm. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So there's a constant fight within all of us. Each and every one of us, there's a constant fight. The flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Understand that? So go ahead to James now. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 5. Mm -hmm. Do ye think that the scripture said it in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us lasted to envy. So the scripture does not say it in vain, because the spirit that dwelleth in us lasted to envy. Go ahead. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Go ahead. Read up chapter 6. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he mm -hmm. giveth more grace. Oh, grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto him. He says, But he giveth more what? But he giveth more grace. But he giveth more grace. But he must not use the grace of the Lord that he gave unto us. He must not have used the grace that is given unto us. And he says, But he giveth more grace. Go ahead. Wherefore, come on. With, wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. But giveth grace unto the humble. When we humble ourselves to what I say, the Lord, the Lord says he's given to give us more grace. You understand? So but watch this. Let's get that entire to verse 11. Let's see why he gave us more grace. The same way he gave grace to the sister. That was just that was just and just by the start of Pharisees. Because remember, don't forget Christ, he took care of the church. He says, Love the wise, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself away. So don't lose the thought. Come on. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Great. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So now grace, the purpose of grace, the purpose of grace is for us to deny ungodliness. That's why Lord gives us, gives us more grace to teach us to deny ungodliness so we can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We encourage us us more grace so that we can learn to deny and that's why grace was given to us. You understand? But he says, but God resisted the proud. Get that in the Fracture chapter 10, Please ask us chapter 10, verse 7. Pride is hateful before God and men. Okay. By both does one commit iniquity. Because when you are in the midst of when you are proud, when, when you are proud, you're gonna commit because loss. No, no, that's it on that. That's it on that. Jump up to what is verse 12. The beginning of pride is when one departed from the from God. And his heart is turned away from his maker. See that thing? So the beginning of pride is when you depart from God. What are you departing from? From God. You depart from his commandments. He says, and his heart is turned from his maker. You don't want to keep commandments. We are prideful. That's what the Lord is saying. Because we resist the laws of the Messiah God. We said, well, we said, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. The Lord says we are prideful. Guess what? You're not going to receive grace when we are in the midst of pride. The Lord says he's not going to give you more grace. He's going to give you up to Satan. That's what he's saying. So go back to James, the fourth chapter. James 4, 6 again. 
James chapter 4 verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Okay. God resisteth the proud, and but by what he giveth grace unto the humble. So when we humble ourselves to the laws of God, guess what? He says, I'm going to give you more grace because you're humbling yourself to what I say of the Lord. You don't want to be prideful anymore. You repent, you get your mind right. So you can be in good standing with the most I got. So go back to John 8. John 8. Because that's when you taught the woman. John 8, verse 11. Read 10, 11. John 8, verse 10, 11. Come on. John chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? Ray. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Did I think it a more great to go up? To deny ungodliness, to stop committing adultery. That's what Christ did right there. He says, Go and neither do I condemn thee. Why? Because the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's why he says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So he gave the grace to deny ungodliness. So she sins no more, but she repents. You understand? That's what Christ did. He took care of the church and he healed the church. That's what he did. You understand? To show that he is cleansed. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 now. Ephesians 5. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. The other thing is, love your wives in the same way as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, the point I wanted to show you is that Christ loved the church. Some examples of how he loved the church. You understand? He loved the church so much so that he took care of it, he fed us. You understand? He healed us, okay? And he gave himself for it. Watch this. Give me that in the um, Get that in Ephesians 5 more. Jump up to verse, verse 1. We'll read 1 and 2. The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 1. Mm. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling support. Savor. So now it says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. You understand? We just went over that. And not only that, but he gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So Christ, not only did he take care of us, not only did he feed us, not only did he heal us, but he died for us so that he can give us more grace for us to deny ungodliness in this present wicked world. Because the world that we're living in is evil, is wicked as hell. But the, because of the, 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 the love of the Most High God through his son, he allowed Christ to feed us, to heal us, to die for us, to give us more grace for us to deny ungodliness, to get ourselves cleaned up before his return. Understand that thing. Now, um, go back to Ephesians 5. Jump down to verse 25 once again. Come on. The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Mm -hmm. And gave himself for it, read. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the way. You see that thing? So not only that, he says that, that he may sanctify it. What is the it? The church. And cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So not only did he what? Did he feed us? He fed us. He healed us. He died for us. He gave us more grace. He also did what? He cleansed us. So now we are using the word of God in the spirit of Christ 
under grace to cleanse ourselves up because Christ taught us, he taught the disciples to teach us, so it is today. It's the same thing that he did back then, the mission is a goal. Because when Christ died, was crucified, and he resurrected, it was the beginning of the last days. You understand? So we've been in the last days from that time until now. And the Lord is cleansing us. He's cleansing us through the what? He's using the prophets to cleanse us, to, to educate us, so that we repent and get our minds right. Okay, read that again, verse 26. The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 26. Go ahead. That he might sanctify and cleanse with the washing of water by the way. Wait. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Mm -hmm. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That thing. So that goes into what? That goes into cleansing it in verse 26 with the washing of water by the word that it might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that they should be holy and without blemish. Now, where am I going? I'm going over this because the, the thing, the, what Christ did for us is our job as men. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with at last the job of the men. I'm not dealing with that today, but I'm, this is, is it's, I'm going, this is part one of that class that's coming. So now understand, Christ took care of us. Christ healed us. He taught us, okay? He died for us. He gave us more grace for us to get our minds right. You understand? Now watch this. Now, what I want you to, what I want you to understand is that you sisters, I need you sisters to pay attention here, okay? Sisters, pay close attention because the sisters, you don't know how to pick men, okay? You don't know how to pick men. You don't know men. That's why you make poor decisions all the time. You don't know how to pick men. You poor. You make poor decisions when it comes to men and when it comes to things that pertain to what? Marriage, that comes to relationships. You make poor decisions. We see it in the world. I see it in Israel as well. Now watch this. Give me the book of Ecclesiasticus, okay? Give me Sarah 37, verse 12. Sarah chapter 37 and verse 12. Read that for me. Okay, I'm going to deal with the things to look for when you're looking for men, the characteristics that the men must have, okay? So this class right here is a prelude to the class that's coming. Watch this. Sarah 37 verse 12, read that. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 37 verse 12. Go ahead. But be continually with the godly man. You see that thing right there, sisters? But be continually with the godly man. So that's the first thing. So, sisters, the Lord is saying you must be continually, not sometimes, not when you feel like it. No, continually means always. It says be continually, always with a godly man. He's going to tell you what a godly man is. Go ahead. Whom thou what? Whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord. Who you know to keep God's laws. So you must be, you must be able, you, when, you must be around this man. You must, under, you must know the con his conversation must be based on God's commandments, his conduct, the things he say. They must be what? They must line up with what the Bible says. It says, but be continually with the godly man who you know to keep the laws of God. Go ahead. Whose mind is according to thy mind. Stop right there. Remember, when we talk about marriage, right? Go back to Genesis 2, read verse 24 again. I'm going to show you something. It says, whose mind is according to thy mind. What does that mean? Whose mind is according to your mind? Watch this. Read that, Genesis 2, 24. The book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore oh. shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That part right there, and they shall be one flesh, whose mind is according to your mind. That means what? You must be on one accord. The two of you must be on one accord. That's why it says whose mind is according to your mind. Because the same mind that he has is the same mind that you've got. You understand? But the, the reason why you are continuing with this man, you prove him in according to the scriptures. You understand? Whose mind is according to your mind. Go back to Sarah 37 verse 12. That's what it says, the two of you shall be one flesh. Okay, read that. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 37, verse 12. Read. But be continual with the God's man, whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord, 
whose mm. mind is according to thy mind. You see that thing? They too, they too shall be one flesh, whose mind is according to your mind. So during the proving process, you must what? Be continual with the godly man who you know to keep the laws of God because you're proving him according to the scriptures. And his mind, both of your mind, you must be one flesh. Meaning what? You must, your first agreement must be what the Bible says. You must agree what the Bible says. Understand what he's saying right here. Whose mind is according to your mind, meaning the two of you shall be one flesh. Because eventually, when you get married, you are going to be joined one to another in one as one flesh. The two of you are going to be one. No more twain, but one flesh. So during the proving process, you proving to see if the two of you can be one flesh and can what? You can be age, you can grow age together. That's what you're proving. You understand? Go ahead. And will sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry. He's going to be there when there's issues. He's going to be there to use the Bible to resolve the issues in the house, to make sure that the church, which is his house, is without wrinkle, without spot, and without blemish. Just like we read in Ephesians 5, 26. Sarak 25 and 1. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 25, verse 1. Come on. In three things I was beautified and stood up beautiful before God and men. Mm -hmm. The unity of brethren, the love of neighbors, a man and a wife that agree together. You see that a man and a wife that agree together because before you become man, man and wife, meaning husband and wife, you have to prove each other. So you as a sister, your job, yes, this man is going to prove you, but your job is to prove him. And the way you prove him, you listen to your fathers. You understand that? You listen to your fathers because your fathers, they know men. We know which men are full of BS. We know who's about the laws of the Most High God. We know who those that are sneaky, they are deceitful. You understand? They are full of BS. We can see, I can see, I can tell. I know which brother is full of BS. I know who's deceitful. I know who's got, um, who, who's got the potential of being abusive. I know who, I can tell. You understand? I can tell. And to, I can tell in real time. Today, I can tell. 2022, I can tell that thing. Now, read that thing again. That's why we bring out these classes to, for the man to get himself right, to examine himself, to know the issues that he's dealing with and being honest with himself. Because if he's not, he is not ready to get married. You understand? Read that again. The book of it is yesterday, chapter 25, verse 1. In three things, I was beautified and stood up beautiful before God and man. The unity of brethren, the Come love on. of neighbors, a man and a wife that agree together. A man and a wife that agree together. The reason why it's important that when you prove, you understand, he will sorrow with thee when thou shalt miscarry. Your mind, the, both of you, you think the same thing. So that when you get married, the two of you, you, are not, you will be no more twain, but one flesh. You will be on one accord. A man and a wife that agree together. The argument that you must have is that said the law, not how you feel, not how you think, but what the most High God says. Understanding that when you are in the world, you make poor decisions. When you come in Israel, make sure you don't make poor decisions still. You understand? You make poor decisions no more. Because why? You're following counsel, you're learning, you're growing, you're maturing, you're applying yourself to the laws of God so you can be able to what? To prepare yourself for a wife. And all, not only that, but to support a wicked nigger. You understand? That's the job. Now watch this. Give me that in Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Because the two of you will not be in one, will not be in agreement if you're operating outside of the laws of God. The minute you go outside of God's commandments, there will not be any agreement whatsoever. Read that. The book of Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Mm -hmm. Can two walk together except they be agreed? See that thing? Two cannot walk together except they agree on what the Bible says. If you agree what the Bible says, the two of you can walk together because why? Now you're preparing yourself to be no more twain but one flesh. But now so that you can be on one accord. You can be in agreement. You understand? Watch this. Give me that in um, 2 Corinthians. Okay. No, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Read verse 10. Watch this. Because the Apostle Paul, he addressed this thing. Because in Christ, you cannot be divided. Watch this. Because what brings you brings you together is who brings you together? Christ. 
Christ is the one that brings you together, bring both of you together. His spirit brings you together, okay? Allows you to walk together, to be one flesh, to be on one accord. Read that, 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. First book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. That you must speak the same thing. The same thing that you speak, remember it says, but be continually with a godly man, whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord. So when he says you must all speak the same thing, what is the things that you're speaking? Get that in Sarah 915. You understand? That you all speak the same thing. Sarah 9, verse 15, read that. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 15. Read. Let thy walk be with the wise and all thy communication in the law of the Musa. You see that thing? And all thy communication in the law of the Musa. So when he says you must all speak the same thing, the same thing that you're speaking in what is what is the laws of the Most High. That's why it says, be continually with the godly men whom you know to keep the commandments of the Most High God. And guess what? When you know, and his mind is according to your mind and vice versa, guess what? He says what? You will all speak the same thing. You're going to speak the same thing. The same thing that you speak, read that again, verse 15. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 15. Mm -hmm. Let thy talk be with the wise Let and your all talk. thy communication. Your talk, your talk, your communication. Go ahead. And all thy communication in the law of the Messiah. You see that thing? And all thy communication in the law of the Messiah. Get that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Watch this. The book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Mm. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Stop right there. He says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? Ephesians 1, verse 11. Read that. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 11. Verse 18. In, in, you know, verse 18, verse 18, that's what I want. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 18. Go ahead. In whom he also trusted. After that, he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You see that thing? The word of truth is the gospel of our salvation. What is the word of truth? The laws of God. So our conversation must be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? The word of truth, which is the gospel of our salvation. So what is the Lord teaching us here? The Lord is teaching you sisters, he says, be continually with the godly man. You must all speak the same thing. He is speaking something contrary to the laws of God that is not the man of the most High God. Because what he speaks is what's in his mind. Is If what is in his mind, he's going to speak it, he's going to act it out. You understand? So you need to be able to be in the scriptures and study so that you'll be able to pick up that that's not the man of the Lord. Why is he doing X, Y, and Z? And which is not what is written in the book. That's how you spot, okay? Now, watch this. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Read that again. First book of Corinthians, chapter 1 verse 10. Read. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, mm -hmm. and, and that there be no divisions among you. You see that thing? Because if you don't speak the same thing, the, the two of you, you too will not be one flesh. You will remain divided. You understand? You will remain divided if the two of you don't speak the same thing. Because if you speak the same thing, there will not be divisions among you. But the minute you start to speak contrary, you are going to be divided. It's not if or maybe, it's a fact. Go ahead. But that he be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see that thing? You must be perfectly joined together. What perfectly joins you together? Get that in Psalms 19, verse 7. That you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The mind that you have is the mind of Christ. So you must be perfectly joined together in the mind of Christ. Okay. Psalms 19, verse 7. So you sisters, you still want to do your own thing. You understand? You are given counsel. You don't follow the counsel. Guess what? You are, you are separating yourself. Why? 
you are separating yourself because you've got lusts that are not fulfilled. And you separating yourself, guess what? You are not ready to prove not to get married. Because why? When if you get married, that marriage is not going to last together with you and that man. Because if the two of you get married and one of you was not ready to get married, guess what? Both of you were not ready to get married. Why? Because you attract what you are. Understand that. Read that in Psalms 19 verse 7. The book of Psalms, chapter 19, verse 7. Okay. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You see that thing? The, the laws of God, they are perfect. They convert the soul. They change you, right? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the same. You see that thing? The laws of God is going to make you wise. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Once again, I'm going to show you something with this. Come on. First book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 10. Now yeah. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among them, but that he be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, what's going to perfectly join you together in the same mind, in the same judgment, is the laws of God which are perfect. Now watch this. Read verse, read verse 11. Read, because remember, the Apostle Paul is addressing the church, but we need to understand Christ, the marriage is a mystery between Christ and the church. The Apostle Paul is addressing the church. The same way as the husband, you address your wife, you take care of your wife, you understand? You feed, you feed your wife, which I'm going to deal with that in a second. Okay, go ahead. But I want to show you how to maintain harmony and have peace in your house. This is what you need to understand. Come on. First book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 11. For he had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which have, are of the house of Chloe, that they are contentious among you. That they are what now? That they are contentious among you. That they are contentions among you, meaning what? Problems. There's contentions among you. That means what? There's evil in the midst. That's why now everybody's contentious. Okay, go ahead. Watch this. Now this I say, mm -hmm. that every one of you say, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. You see that now. You see what was going on in the Church of Corinth. There was divisions among them. One one group was saying, "Me, I only listen to Paul." Another one was saying, "I only listen to Apollos." Another one was saying, "I only listen to Cephas." Another one was saying, "I only listen to Christ." Evil as hell. And that's the same thing that I see with some of you brothers. You understand? I'll I'll give a command to one of the person, to brother such such, give them this command. They're not gonna follow the command that is given to that brother because they say, No, I want to hear to, from leadership, then I'm gonna do it. You the devil, the Bible speaks of. You're gonna cause Israel, you're gonna cause problem for us because that's not the spirit of Christ. That's the same thing that the apostle Paul was addressing. You understand? Go ahead. So, likewise, in your marriage. That's exactly how it's going to be. You understand? Read. Come on. Is Christ divided? Stop right there. You what? see what he's asking? Hold on. Is Christ divided? Because that's what they were implying. They were implying as though Christ is divided. But we read in verse 10, it says that there be no divisions among you, that ye should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So that's why the Apostle Paul asked the question. Very pertinent question. Read that again, verse 13. First book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 13. Is Christ divided? Mm -hmm. Was Paul crucified for you? Read. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So what was he asking? The thing that he was addressing was what? There were divisions among them. You understand? So they were not moving in the spirit of Christ. They were all wrong. You understand? Even those one will say, oh, I only listen to Christ. They was wrong too. Why? Because Christ was not causing divisions in the churches. Christ, what was he doing? He was bringing unity to the 12 tribes of Israel that we may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Likewise, in your marriage, that's how it must be. You must be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And you sisters, you must be able to understand that, that you must be able to be able to pick up if this man 
is about the, the, building, the building up of the 12 tribes of Israel, is about bringing unity to the 12 tribes, you understand, is about his nation. He's about doing the work of the Most High God to glorify the Most High God, which is in heaven. And guess what? He's in the scriptures. His communication is in the laws of God. His conduct is in the laws of God. His mannerism is in the laws of God. His speech is in the laws of God. Everything must be, he must be an example of what this Bible reflects. That's how you pick up a man of God or not. Now watch this. Now I'm going to show you something, right? Um, give me, go back to Sirach 37. Okay, before I go somewhere else. Give me Sirach 37, give me 12 once again. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 37, verse 12. Go ahead. But be continual with a good man, whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord, whose mind is according to thy mind, and will sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry. So for you to know if this man keeps the commandments of the Lord, this way how you do it. Get that in First John 4 and 1. First John. Okay. First John chapter 4, verse 1. Watch this. Because you must know that he keeps the commandments of the Lord. And this is how you prove that he does or he does not. Read that, First John 4 and 1. First book of John, chapter 4, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Stop right there. Because, hold on, but try the spirits whether they are of God. He says, don't believe every Negro with fringes in a Bible. He says, but try the spirits whether they are of God. What you sisters must do. But the thing is, you sisters, you are horny, you are thirsty, you understand? You are hasty. That's why now you don't want to try the spirits, whether they are of God. You try the spirit by the spirit because you are in the spirit. Go ahead. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. They're going out with Bibles, just niggas with Bibles, okay? Now watch this. So for you to prove the spirit by the spirit, you try the spirit because to try means to prove, to test, okay? You try the spirit by the spirit. Get that in Sirach 6 and 7. Because you must try the spirit by the spirit. You understand? You, that means you yourself, you must be in the laws of God. You must be in the scriptures, okay? Watch this. Read that. Sirach 6 and 7. Yep. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, verse 7. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. So now the Lord is saying, if you were to get a friend, you must prove them first. Meaning you must try the spirit, whether they are of God. You try the spirit by the spirit, and you don't be hasty to credit them. Don't be too quick to give them credit. Why? Because... You need to take time to see how they behave themselves, how they act, how they conduct themselves, the things they say, the decisions they make. Is it for their own benefit or is it for your benefit? Or not only that, is it for the benefit of the 12 tribes of Israel? Is it for the benefit of the board? Read again verse 7. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, verse 7. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. You're not hasty to credit him. That's how you prove whether they, well, that's how you prove that they keep the laws of God. They are about God's commandments. That's why it says, be continually with a godly man whom you know to keep the commandments. The only way for you to know is to prove him first. Be, and don't be hasty to credit him. Why? Because time and you proving, you studying, you applying, you asking questions about his behavior and his conduct to see if he's going to go into the laws of God how he thinks and all that, that's how you prove. That's how you try the spirit, whether he is of the Lord. You understand? That's how you do that. Because a lot of you sisters, you're too quick to credit. Why? Because you don't listen. You think you know men. You don't know men. Not only that, you think you can win him over because your cookie is too good. You think you can change him because your cookie's got the magic. No, you're wrong, sister. I'm going to tell you right now. You're wrong. You're 100% incorrect. I'm going to show you in the Bible how you make sure that this man is lining up with what this Bible is saying. Remember what we read. Don't lose the thought. It says Christ took care of the church. Just same way, the man must also take care of his wife, his house, his nation, 
You understand? Now, keep going. Read verse 8. You know what? Hmm. Before you get there, let's get to Rag 19 verse 4. Read that for me. I want to read that first. Rag 19 verse 4. Watch this. The book of it is yesterday, chapter 19, verse 4. Mm -hmm. He that is hasty to be credit is light mind. Meaning he's stupid. They are dumb as hell. You understand? As a sister, you cannot be hasty to give credit. The only reason why you will be hasty to give credit to this man is because why? Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which is not of the father, but is of the world. Read that again. I'm going to show you the reason why you will be hasty to give credit. Read. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 19, verse 4. He mm -hmm. that is hasty to give credit is like mine. Come on. And he that sinneth shall offend against his own soul. You see that thing? The sin is what? Is you being hasty to give credit. You're going to destroy your own soul. That's what the Lord is saying, right? Okay, come on. Watch this. Verse 5. Whoso taketh pleasure in wickedness shall be condemned. Stop right there. So whoso taketh pleasure in wickedness shall be condemned. Because the pleasure that you, you take in wickedness is what? You too hasty to give credit. So now you're going to take pleasure in your wickedness of being hasty to give credit to this man. You understand? Go ahead. But he that resisted pleasures crowneth his life. But he that resisted pleasures because the pleasures come from what? The flesh. The, he says, but he that resisted pleasures crown of his life, you're going to receive a crown of righteousness. So, but if you are too hasty to credit, guess what? You're going to be taken by your pleasure in wickedness. You're going to die. That's what the Lord is saying. So to prevent all that, he says, don't give, don't be hasty to give credit. Because the only reason why you'd be hasty to give credit to this man is because of what? Get that in 1 John 2, verse 15 and 16. This is the reason why. 1 John 2, verse 16, 15 and 16. Read that. First book of John, chapter 2, verse 15. Come on. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in Because it says, don't love the world. Because why? Because of the things that are in it. The world is evil right now, and it's going to get worse. You understand? Next verse. Watch this. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Stop. And the stop. Lust stop. Stop right there. The lust of the flesh. So one of the reasons why is, is sisters, you'll be hasty to give credit to this man is because of the lust of the flesh. Remember, it says, whoso taketh pleasure in wickedness shall be condemned. But who saw he that resisted the pleasures crowned his life? So when the lust of the flesh is the reason why you be hasty to give credit. That's number one. Come on. And the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Because why? Because with your eyes, you lust. No, he's got he's got big muscles, he's tall, he's handsome, is this, he's got big feet. You understand? You're looking at the, all the superficial stuff. So guess what? The lust of your eyes, because of the eyes with what you see with your eyes, you lust. So it's all going back to lust at the end of the day. It's going back to lust. Get that in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 2, just to put the sisters in the right mindset so that you make, you make righteous decisions in picking a mate. You don't make lustful decisions in picking a mate. You make a righteous decision. Watch this. Sarah 11, verse 2. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 2. Mm -hmm. Commend not a man for his beauty. You see that thing? He says, don't commend a man for his beauty. Oh, he's so handsome. Oh, he's so this. Oh, he's so... you commending this man for his beauty. You understand? Beauty is vain, the Lord tells you in Proverbs 31. Go ahead. Neither adore a man for his outward appearance. And don't hate the man because of his outward appearance because he does not meet your so-called, quote-unquote, beauty standards that you've learned in the world of what a man should look like. No, 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 no. The standards that you must have is what the standard is, the standard that the Most High God has set out. That's the standards that you, are, you, you live by. That's the standards that you make decisions based upon. Understand that. Go back to 1 John 2, verse 16. Facebook of John, chapter 2, verse 16. 
mm -hmm. for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the arms and the pride of life. You see that thing? The pride of life. The pride of life is what I was able to, to hit that. I was able to sleep with that. I got him. You understand? I was able to be married to that, but he's not, it, was not, it was not based on the laws of God. It was based on your lust. That's why I tell you, sisters, when you come into this truth, always remember the type of men that you dealt with in the world must not be the same type of men that you deal with in this truth. Because if that's the same, if that's the case, guess what? You're still moving according to your lust. You're still making decisions based on your lust. Guess what? You're going to get hurt. You're going to regret it. But at that point, you made it to him. If you discover that he's a bum, he's lazy, he doesn't want to work, you understand? He's a couch potato. He, all of that, guess what? Now he's yours. You understand, sisters? So I need you, sis, this right now, sisters, I'm giving you standards on how to pick men. Understand that thing. Keep going. It's not of the father, but it's of the world. So the, guess what? He's of Satan. So don't, the reason why you be hasty is because of this right here, what we just read. It's like 18 verse 30. I'm going to give you the characteristics of why you make hasty decisions to credit a man. This is the reason. Last, last and more last. Read that. It's like 18 verse 30. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 18 verse 30. Mm -hmm. Go not after thy last. You see what the Bible is saying? Don't go after your last. That's why it says last, plural. The last of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, which is not of the Father, but of the world. Go ahead. But refrain thyself from thine appetites. But, but stay away, but abstain yourself from your appetites. What is your appetite? No, he's going to have big muscles. No, he's going to have big feet. You understand? He's going to have good hair. He's going to have all of these things that you're listing. Guess what? That Those are your appetites. That's not, that's not going to last. You understand? Because once the, the last is out, because last it wears off. Now you back to reality now. Now you now you have to now, now to start to learn this man, how he is, how he behaves himself, how he is when he's upset, when he's angry. Does he punch you in the face? Is he violent? All of these things, these are the things that you need to learn and know about. But if you focus on your last, you will overlook those things. You'll be clouded by your lustful judgment. Understand that. Read that again, verse 30. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 18, verse 8, go not after thy past, but refrain thyself from thine appetites. But you must refrain yourself from your appetites. You understand? So that's what the Lord is saying right there. So because your appetites, who gave you the appetites that you've got? The world. The world has given you your appetites regarding men, not the most high. So when you make decisions, you must always remember the old woman is there which will be attracted to the old man in the congregation who has not gotten himself right, who is not getting himself right. He is still getting himself right. He's not ready. So if you go by the last that you learned in the world that these are the last when it comes to men, these are the appetites that you must have when it comes to men, guess what? You're going to make poor, and you're going to make a poor decision. Understand that thing. That's what the Lord is really trying to show you. Get that in Sarah 27. Sarah 27. Okay, what is this for? Watch this. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 27, verse 4. Go ahead. As when one shifts with the sea, the refuse remain, so the filth of men in his top. Read that again, verse 4. I, wanna, I want you to see this thing. I want you sisters to pay close attention. Read that again, verse 4. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 27, verse 4. Mm -hmm. As when one sifted with a seed, the refuse remain. Stop right there. So the as, a, as one sifted with a seed, because a sieve is, the, is like a safe, is like a filter. As one that filters with a sieve, the refuse remain, meaning the garbage will remain. What is the filter in this case? The Bible. The Bible is the filter. The Bible will be able to separate the good from the bad, the garbage from the good. So here's letting you know, as one sifteth with the sieve, the refuse remain. So is what? So the filth of, a, of men in his talk. He says, so the filth of men in his talk. For you to be able to tell, 
You understand what type of man this is? You must use the Bible to examine this speech. That's why it says, so the filth of man in his talk. The things he says, you must filter them with the laws of God. Or, mm, that's not biblical. That's evil as hell. That's wicked as hell what he's saying. The hell is this? That's how you filter. You'll be able to pick up the things that he says that comes out of his mouth. But you sisters, because you horny, you thirsty, guess what? You make hasty decisions because why? Because of lust and your appetites. You understand? Go ahead. The fairness proven the potter's vessels. You see that thing? The fairness will prove the potter's vessel because a potter makes pottery. He makes pottery. You understand? But the fire will prove the, the, the potter's vessel, how strong it is, how it was put together. Read. So the trial of man is in his is in his reason. You see that the, the test of a man is the way he reasons. We are not talking about the man that is, is clever, is is he's a, they say he's clever is mm -mm -mm -mm. we talk about if he's wise. He says, so what? He says the trial of man is in his reason, the way he reasons. How does he reason? Get that in e, get that. Get that in Acts chapter 17, real quick. You understand? So is the trial of man is in his reasoning. Okay. His reasoning will tell you whether he is full of BS or he is full of the spirit of the Lord. Read that. Acts 17, verse 2. Start up verse 2. The book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 2. Read. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days risen out of the scriptures. You did what? Risen with them. Out of the scriptures. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So go back to Sirach 27. That's five. Because the reason why I like this scripture so much is because I can tell by the man's speech or this one is full of shit. Excuse my French, but it is what it is. Read what you got. Sirach 27 verse 5. Come on, come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 27 verse 5. The fairness proves the potter's best. Mm -hmm. So the trial of man is in his reason. So the trial of man is in his reasoning because he must reason out of the scriptures. You understand? But not only reason out of the scriptures, but he must act out of the scriptures. So if he's reasoning out of the scriptures, all praises, now follows what? His actions, his conduct. Does his action equal what he's saying, even though he's reasoning out of the scriptures? Keep going. Verse 6. The fruit declareth if the tree had rest. Mm-hmm. So is the utterance of a conceit in the heart of man. You see that thing? The fruit will tell you if this the fruit will tell you if this tree has been taken care of. It says the same way the utterance of a conceit in the heart of man, what comes out of his mouth is based on what's in his mind. If it's in his mind, he's gonna do it. So if what's in his mind is contrary to what the, the Bible says, guess what? His speech will also tell you that is he, what he's saying is contrary. To what the Bible says. But you have to be in the scriptures to know that. You have to listen to your fathers in this truth to know those things, to spot those things. Go ahead. Praise no man before thou hearest him speak. Mm -hmm. For this is the trial of man. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, Praise no man before you hear them speak. Because their speech, their conversation, their utterance must be what? Must be proved with the laws of God. Go ahead, read that again, verse 7. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 27, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Praise no man before thou hearest him speak. For this is the trial of man. For this is the test of a man. The test of a man is in his speech, in his talk. You understand? Now, hmm, go back to Sirach 6, verse 8. Read verse 8 now. Sirach 6 and verse 8. I'm going to show you something. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, verse 8. For mm -hmm. some man is a friend for his own occasion. Right? And will not abide in the day of thy trouble. You see what the Bible is saying? It is because some man is a friend for his own occasion. They just want the box. They'll say the right things. You understand? They'll act the right way. Because remember, men are like hunters. Okay? They hunt. The same we ever see a lion in the jungle, looking for a prey. They take their time, they hunt. 
They study how the prey moves so that when they pray, Allah society, guess what? The lion will devour you. So likewise, read that again, verse 8. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, verse 8. For some mm -hmm. man is a friend for his own occasion and will not abide in the day of that trouble. You see what he's saying? is says, for some man is a friend for his own occasion. They just want the box. That's it. Once they get the box, they're gone. And guess what? You Let's say you prove this brother. We prove him and you prove him. And we, we prove him, we discover that mm, something is not right. Something is amiss. But when because you haste your honey, you make a hasty decision to marry this man. Guess what? He sexes you. And after he sexes you, he says, you know what? I cannot do this. I'm out. We cannot go out and look for him in the world to say, listen, bro, you made, you made a promise. You, 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 are, you, you made a promise. You, you say you want to get married. You got married to this woman. Now you must fulfill the promises you make. We cannot do that. We can't force him. We can't go into the world and pull him back in and say, listen, you, you are bound to this woman for life. We can't. We cannot. The only man that you're going to trust that you're going to keep God, that they're going to trust to be with you, according to the scriptures, to age with you, is the one that is applying the laws of God and following counsel and following the guidelines that we set out according to as it is written. That's the man that, you know, we can say, okay, this one is a keeper. But that takes time to do that. It takes time to prove that. It takes time to investigate that. It's not a six-month project. It's not a 12-month project. It's two years project. Because guess what? If you say, ah, two years is too long, you simple as hell. Because you're going to spend the rest of your life with this man. You understand? So you better make sure that you, this is the right thing to do according to the scriptures. You've done your checks and balances. You followed counsel every step of the way. Understand that thing. Now, watch this. Now, go back to Ephesians 5. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, right? Ephesians 5, read verse. Ephesians 5 is 25. I'm going to show you something this day. Watch this. The book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, right. love your wives, mm. even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He says, husband, love your wives. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, right? So, so now here's the things that we I want to deal with. Actually, I want to deal with these things. So let's let's deal with um, you know, because Christ took care of the church. He fed the church. Christ fed the church, right? He fed the church. He took care of the church. Let's give me the book of Exodus twenty one. Watch this. Exodus twenty one. Read verse. Exodus twenty one, and read verse ten. The book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 10. Mm -hmm. If ye take him another wife, their food, a raiment, and a duty of men shall he not diminish. Read that again, verse 10. Now, this goes into um, a sister that was betrothed, you understand? Because for six years, you had to work for this man. On the seventh year, you get released. But it so happens that this man decides, listen, I want to be I want to marry you. So if he now goes and takes another wife, meaning the sister that has been working for six years and the seven years, instead of being released, guess what? She says, okay, I want to take he, her as a wife. Okay. But we're not talking about multiple wives here because this was back then when we, we could do that. You understand? But under Christ, there's no such thing as a multiple wife. Understand that thing. Read verse 10 again. The book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 10. Wait. If he take him another wife, mm -hmm. a food, a raiment, and a duty of marriage, shall he not diminish? So now this goes into what a man that takes a wife. He says, a man that takes a wife, he says what? He says, her food, meaning what? Where does food go? Brothers, where does food go? Come on. So the hair guy, where does food go?
Okay, so the Neham, where does food go? The mouth to the stomach, sir. No, 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 no. No, where does food go? Where do you store this food? I need you to think. It says, read that again, verse 10. Stay in the spirit. I need you to pay attention. Okay? Sisters, pay attention also. Especially you sisters. Okay? Read verse 10. Come on. The book of Exodus, chapter 10. One verse 10. Read. If he take him and have a wife, have food. Have what? Have food. Have food. Where does food go? Where do you store the food? Where do you store the food? In the kitchen, sir. Yeah, that means the kitchen is part of the what? The house, sir. Uh-huh. So that means you have to have a what? A house, sir. A house. That means for you to have that house, you must have a what? A job, sir. A job. You see how this works? Read that part again. The book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 10. Really? If he take him another wife, their food. Their food, which goes into the house that he pays for. Go ahead. Their raiment. Their raiment, that's clothing. Where does clothes go? Where do they go? In the house, in the hot room, sir. In the house, right? Which you pay for. So this, the food and the raiment, I mean, the, the food and the raiment is not going to be on the streets. No. Is going to be in the house that he pays for, that he owns. Go ahead. And a duty of marriage. And where does that take place? In the bedroom, sir. In the bedroom. That's in the house. Okay. So when you deal with your wife, say, when you deal with your husband sexually and all that, that must what? It must, it must not take place in your, in your mother's house. It must not take place in your mother's bedroom. Oh, no. It must take care in a take place in your house that you own. You understand that you pay for. Okay? Read that part again. And her duty of marriage mm -hmm. shall he not diminish. Shall he not diminish? Meaning what? You must provide for these things. So that's why I go back to Genesis 2.24 again. The book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall Amen. cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You know, that's why he said what he said. You leave your father and your mother, that means you have a job. You have a place to stay. You understand? And you join unto your wife, and guess what? A food arrangement, the duty of marriage will take place in the bedroom. That's the house you own. He said, they, said, they two shall be one flesh. That's why Moses said what he said here. You understand? These things must be taken care of. So a man of the Most High God, he will have these things on lock. You understand? You brothers that are not married yet, guess what? You have jobs. You have a place to stay. Some of you, you are still staying with your mother. You understand? Lost will, you're saving money. Okay? You're saving money. You're not just staying with your mom. Now, here's the thing. So, yes... Those of you that are you you are you are, you, you are working you have, a, you have a you have a place to stay. The requirement is you need to save money. The saving money is to what? Is for you to have a house so you can what? So you can have you can store food, raiment for your wife, your children, and duty of marriage where you consummate the marriage and all that. You pay for you you know you deal with your wife sexually and all that with your husband. He says, those things, you cannot diminish them. They are part of what? Being a man. So you sisters, these are things that a man must have. Not only that, you brothers, uh, you better make sure that you're saving money every month for love all. I hope you're doing that. You brothers, I hope you're saving money for love all. I hope you're doing that. You understand? Now, before there's even a sister in the congregation that you can say, I want to prove. You better be saving money for Lobol. You better be doing that. You better be putting a stash away every month for Lobol. I hope you're doing that thing. Now, give me that in Sarak 29, 21. Sarak 29, verse 21. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 29, verse 21. Mm -hmm. The chief thing for life is water and bread and clothing and in house 
to cover shade. These are, things, these are the most important things that as a man you must provide. Water, bread, clothing, and a house to cover shame. These things as a man, you must, these are the basic things that a man must have. You understand? Before you can even think of marriage, these are the things, these are the basic things you must have. You understand? So much so that you know how to manage them because when you get married, you need to have them on lock. You, need, you cannot be now building a plane while you're flying it. You cannot build, build a plane while you it's in the air. No. You must now already rehearse those righteous acts now before you find a wife. Before you get married, you guess what? Water, because you pay for it. Bread, you pay for that. Clothing, you pay for that. And then house to cover shame, you pay for that. Okay, go ahead. Better is the life of a poor man in a mean cottage than delicate fare in another man's house. You see that thing? Is it better for you to be in that poor, poor cottage in that, you know, you know, in your in your little, you know, you know, mean cottage than living good in an in somebody else's house. He says that's the that's the that's a bum mentality. That's a bum mindset. Don't have a bum mindset. We cannot have bums up in here. Go ahead. Be it little or much, hold thee co contented. Be content. That thou hear not the he says, but be content. Be it little or much, what you've got is as wholly contented. Mean, be content with what you've got. Go ahead. That thou hear not the reproach of thy house. That you don't hear the reproach of your house. Meaning what? You live in somebody else's house. They're going to talk about how much food you're consuming. You understand how much water and electricity you are consuming. You guess what? They're going to talk about you and not in a good way. That's what the Lord is saying. So to avoid all that, he says, guess what? You must what? You must focus on these things first and foremost. You understand? That's what the Lord is saying. Because guess what? If you don't focus on these things, these are the things that are going to happen. Next verse. Watch this. Go ahead. So it is a miserable life to go from house to house See that thing? for where thou art a stranger. It's a miserable life to go from house to house. It's a miserable life. If you don't have a, a house to cover shame, you're going to be with him from house to house. The Lord says that's a miserable life. You understand? So you should not be thinking about a woman whatsoever if you are in this situation right here. Go ahead. For where thou art a stranger, thou darest not open thy mouth. Meaning you cannot say nothing because you are a stranger. It's not your house. You cannot say nothing. It's not your house. You understand? You don't got nothing to say because what? You are a vagabond. You are a bum. You're moving from place to house. Place to place, house to house. The Lord says, no, mm -mm -mm. you cannot move like that. Now understand? Watch this. Get that in Sarak. Okay, Sarak 36. Sarak 36 and verse 26. Watch this. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 36, verse 26. Who will trust a thief well appointed mm -hmm. that skippeth from city to city? You see that thing? Because a thief skips from city to city because they don't want to get caught. Likewise, a bum, that's how they move. They move from house to house, so they don't want to get caught nor pay any bills. That's what he's saying. So they skip from city to city because he's a bum. Right? So who will believe a man that has no house? You see that thing? So he's comparing a man, a thief, to a man that has no house because he's like a thief. He's eating, from, he's eating from another man's table. So guess what? That's not a man of the law. He's not ready yet. Okay, come on. And lodges wheresoever the night taketh him. He's going to sleep wherever the night takes him. So guess what? This is a bum. The Lord is saying, sisters, these are the type of things that you need to look out for. That's what the Lord is saying. He must have his own house. He must live in his own place. Even if it's a, it's a mean cottage, but it's still his. You understand? So that's better. Okay, now watch this. Get that in um, Sarak 39, verse 26. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 39, verse 26. Mm -hmm. The principal things for the whole use of man's life are water, Come fire, mm -hmm. iron, and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grain, and oil, 
and clothes. See that these are the cheap things for the for the, the the principal things is the cheap things for life. So these things are needed when you understand as a man, the man that is preparing himself to be a husband, because you brothers, that's how you must prepare yourself. You better be preparing yourself to be husbands before your wife even comes to into the picture. Why? Because when as you rehearsing the acts right now, you get your house in order. You get your mind right. You get a job. Get a place to stay. Pay bills. Know how to manage your money. Know how to manage your budget. So on and so forth. You must be able to do all that. Save up. Save up for ball. You understand? Put some money aside because you know, I'm going to get married one day. And the wife that's coming, I need to prepare for her already. If you're not doing that, you have no business being here. I'm going to tell you straight up. Okay? Go ahead. All these things are are for good to be to the God. So the sinners, they are turned into evil. So to the sinners, they are turned into evil. He says, all these things are, are good, are for good to the godly. To the godly, these things are good. But to the sinners, they are turned against them. They are used against them. Understand that. That's what the Lord is, is showing us right here. So, watch this. Now, remember, Christ fed the people. He fed the nation. He fed us. So as a man, that's exactly the same thing that we have to do as men. We must be able to provide. Men are providers. You understand? Watch this. Get that in Genesis 30 verse 30. Men are providers. Our job is to provide for our families, okay? And for our nation. Read that. Genesis 30 verse 30. You know what? Start of us. Yeah, let's just get to the point. Genesis 30 verse 30. Read that. The book of Genesis chapter 30 verse 30. Mm -hmm. For it was a little which thou had has before I came. And it is now increased into a multitude. And the Lord has blessed thee since my coming. And now, when shall I provide for my own now also? You see that thing? When shall I provide? When shall I provide? When shall I provide for my own house also? This is our forefather Jacob talking to Laban, his, his uncle. No, no, his father-in-law. So, What's going on? That's his uncle, right? Is this uncle of his father-in-law? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that's Laban, right? Yeah, that's Laban. He was talking to Laban. So, so he says, when shall I provide for my own house also? Because that's, what, that's where his mindset was. Because, listen, he wanted to take care of his wives. You understand? Leah and Rachel. He says, now it's time for me to go look for the, to the affairs of my house so I can provide for my own house also. Because, guess what? Since I've been here, You've been waxing rich. It's time for me to go. I need to take care of my wives and my children. So that's the mindset. So sisters, that man must be like that. He must be, he must have the mindset of what? Taking care of you. Taking care of the nation. You understand? Watch this. Now, watch this. Let's go to the book. Go to Sarah 7 verse 15 real quick. Sarah chapter 7 verse 15. The book of it is yesterday, chapter 7, verse 15. Wait. Hate not laborers' work. Or don't hate laborers' work. Don't hate to labor. You understand? Don't hate laborers' work. Go ahead. Neither husbandry. Neither husbandry. Husbandry goes into farming. Okay, go ahead. Which the Most High has ordained. The Most High God has ordained laborers' work. So we must labor as men. We must have jobs. A man must have a job. That's what the Lord is saying. Now watch this. Give me that in Thessalonians, okay? First Thessalonians chapter 3. Give me that in Thessalonians, right? Second Thessalonians 3. Start of his, yeah. Start of his 6. Second, second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6. I'm going to show you something. Read that. Second book of Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6. Go ahead. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he withdrew yourself from every brother that walketh his order, hmm. and not after the tradition which he received of us. So the Apostle Paul is addressing the church in Thessalonica, okay, which was a synagogue of the Jews. So he said, he said listen, withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disordered and not after the tradition which he received of us. Because what was the disorder? 
The disorder was a brother who did not want to work. We did not want to get a job. He didn't want to work. You understand? So, because we had a brother that almost joined us. He was with us for a while, um, uh, but he wanted to be, he wanted to be a stay-at-home stay dad. You cannot make this up. He wanted to be a stay-at-home dad. Hmm? We're like, listen, you need to get a job. You need to be able to provide for your family. Your wife cannot be the one that is running the house, the one that is paying for bills, going to work. When you look, you will stay at home looking after the kids. What the hell is this? You understand? We had a brother, it's not so long ago, a couple of months back. Yeah. So what did the Bible say? Read verse 6 again. Second book of Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 6. Now right. we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he withdraw yourself from every brother and walketh his order, and not after the tradition which he received of us. I'm going to tell you what those traditions are. We just read an example of it in Genesis 30, verse 30, in Sirach 7, verse 15, Exodus 21, verse 10. Go ahead. For yourselves know how he ought to follow us, for we mm -hmm. behave not ourselves disorderly among you. You see what he's saying? He says, you ought to follow us because we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. He says, we did not, we don't, we're not walking disorderly among you, meaning lead by example. Come on. Neither did we eat any man's bread or not. You see that thing? He says, we did not eat any man's bread for nothing. Meaning what? We did not rely on the congregation to take care of us. That's why we have jobs. Unlike the Christian pastors, because they rely on the congregation to take care of them. So those are not the men of the Lord. In Israel, we cannot have that in Israel. Okay? Read that part again. Neither did we eat any man's bread or not. Read. But wrought with labor and travail night and day. You see that thing? But we wrought with labor and travail night and day. Meaning what? We had jobs. Go ahead. That we might not be chargeable of any of you. No, no, no. Read that right. That we may what? That we might be not be what? That we might not be chargeable to any of you. That we might not be chargeable to any of you. What does that mean? Meaning what? We're not, we're not going to rely on you to take care of us. Yes, we teach you. Yes, we're the leaders. But we're not going to rely on you to take care of us. We have jobs. That's why we wake up in the morning. We do nine to five. Why? Because the Lord says, hate not laborers work. Go ahead. Not because we have not power. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. You see that thing? He says, not that because, not because we don't have the power to compel you to do that because we teach you. But he says, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. You understand? To get jobs. Right? For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You see that thing? If any does not want to go and get a job, he says, neither should he have food. Neither should he eat because he does not want to go out there and work. The law says, neither should he eat. And that's the law that we apply. We're not talking about a brother that's literally that's looking for work. We talk about the brother who does not want to look for work, who doesn't want to work. The law says we must separate ourselves from that man, from that brother, because he's working disorderly. Okay, come on. For we hear that there are some which walk among disorder, mm -hmm. working not at all, but are busy bodies. You see that thing? It says, we hear that some of you which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, meaning they don't want to look for work and they don't want to work. It says, but they are busy bodies. You understand? If in every man, if everybody's business. Why? Because they are too idle, which teaches much evil. You understand? So we had a brother with us. And guess what? We had to separate ourselves from him. But because he wanted to what? We said, bro, why aren't you coming to camp? No, I'm looking after the kids. I'm changing diapers. What the hell is this? So sisters, these are not the, those, those, those are bums. Don't, these are, those are not the men that you must what? You must associate yourself with. Mm -mm. No. The, neither will we so associate ourselves with. Why? Because we cannot allow any brother to be among us to work to work this or to work disorderly when it comes to this as an example. Go ahead. 
Now then, that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with mm -hmm. quietness they work and eat their own bread. You see that thing? With quietness and stop being busy bodies, they must work and eat their own bread. You understand? That's what the Lord commanded Adam in Genesis 3.17. Okay? Read. But he, brethren, be not weary in well doing. Uh, don't be weary in well doing, meaning what? Meaning what? Don't be faint in doing well, meaning what? Don't stop working. You must work. You must labor. Why? Because you get to benefit. Your nation gets to benefit because but some of you, I went over the scriptures about this. Some of you, guess what? Some of you, you hate giving arms. Some of you, you do that. You know who you is. Some of you hate giving arms. You understand? Yes, you do give arms, but you hate doing it. You better get your spirit right. Watch this. Get that because guess what? We need arms. Brothers and sisters have leg in the congregation. We need arms. Listen, we need to help brother such and such. We need to help sister such and such. Why? Because we must take care of each other. We must apply that royal law. Understand that thing. The same way Christ took care of the church, we must do the same. Now, watch this. Get that in um, mm, yeah, Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Read that. The book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. Read let him that stole steal no more, mm -hmm. but rather let him labor, working with his working with his hands the thing which is good, mm -hmm. that he may have to give to him that need. You see that thing? So the reason why you work is not just for you, it's for your brother that has leg, it's for your sister that has leg. That's why he's saying he says, but, but rather let him labor. He says, the one that used to steal, they must stop stealing but rather get a job. So that goes for our brothers our brothers that are out there that are robbing, that are taking people's phones, that are jigging cars, that all that, they must stop doing that and get a job. You understand? And labor. Working with their hands, the thing which is good, meaning get an honest job and get paid the right way, that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's the reason why you do that. That's why as a congregation, no man is an island. You understand? We have to work. We have to work together, help each other to be able to build the twelve tribes of Israel, to build our congregation. We must do that because brothers and sisters will walk into the congregation. They're gonna have needs. They believe on Christ, but they will have needs. We must be able to give those things that are necessary for them to survive: food, raiment, clothing, roof over their heads. We're gonna need to provide those things. Why? Because they believe on Christ, they keep the commandments, but these are the things they need. We must be able in a position to help them. You understand? That's what the Lord is saying right there. Okay? Now, and sisters, brothers that don't want to give arms, you stay away from that wicked Negro. Because guess what? He's going, also going to be cheap in your house. When you get married, in your marriage, guess what? He's going to be a cheap Negro. He's not going to be able to pay for anything. He's not going to be able to buy for anything. He's going to be a stingy, wicked Negro. Guess what? Those are the things that you must look for also. You must look out for those things. You must be aware of such things. Why? Because it's necessary for you to know this man, if he's cheap now and he's not married, when he gets married, guess what? We're going to struggle in the house. So, sisters, these are the things you look out for. We are not, because uh, I know that's going to come up in some council. We are not talking about a brother that he's got a job, you understand, and he's got a low-paying job, and he's still building himself up to get a better paying. We're not talking about that type of brother. I'm not talking about that, okay? Because I know he's going to come up soon. Now watch this. Mm. Uh, give me... Yeah, go back to Thessalonians. I think I need to go back there. Second Thessalonians, okay? Chapter 3, read verse 14. Watch this. Second book of Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 18. If any man obey not our way by this epistle, note that man and have no him, company with him. Put him on blast. He's put him on blast. He says, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, meaning point him out, and have no company with him. Don't associate with yourself with him. Go ahead. That he may be ashamed. 
that he may be ashamed. Next verse. Come on. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him. But admonish him as a brother. He says, but don't count him as an enemy. He's not our enemy. But we says we must correct him. We must check him as a brother. Say, bro, you need to get a job. You need to go look for work. You understand? You need to labor. You cannot be wandering from place to place, being a bum, eating from other men's table. That's not good. You understand? It's embarrassing. You cannot do that. Because there are brothers who don't want to work. There are brothers who don't want to get a job. We've experienced one. There are those that are going to come in they're going to have the same mindset too. Understand that. Okay. Now, watch this. Because we dealt with, you know, brother getting a, a brother must have a job. You understand? He must be able to take care of things. He must be able to pay for stuff. Okay. So I'm not talking about the sisters today. I'm talking about the brothers. That you brothers, these are the things that you must have. Okay. Because how the hell are you going to get married? But you say you, you, you are in this truth. You say you're keeping the commandments of the Lord, but you're not preparing yourself for marriage. You say you're preparing yourself for marriage, but you're not saving money for low ball. You're not preparing yourself for marriage. You understand? You must prepare yourself for marriage, brothers. And the proof of that is, yes, you're keeping the commandments of the Lord, which is, that's given. That's a given. But you must be saving money for you to be able to get married to the sister. You understand? Understand that thing. Because watch this. Hmm. Give me. Give me the book of Tobit. Okay. Give me Tobit chapter 7. It's the start of verse 13. Because what you need to understand is that the father's role is going to be what? Is going to be taken over by the husband when my daughter gets married. Guess what? This man must take over the responses, the things that I used to do. But I, when I used to take care of my family, my girls, you know, my daughters and all that, taking off their house, feeding them, clothing them, teaching them, providing for them and all that, the roof over their heads and all that. Guess what? You as the man, the husband now, you take my daughter in marriage, you need to provide for those things. You cannot say I'm taking you taking my daughter, but you don't meet those requirements. You're not ready. You cannot take my daughter in marriage. Hell no. Because she's going to starve. No, that's not going to happen. Get that in um, Toby chapter 7. Start with 13. The book of Toby chapter 7 is 13. Read. Then he called his daughter Sarah. No, no, start with 12. Start with 12. Start with 12. The book Come of Toby chapter 7 verse 12. Read. And Raguel said, Then take care from henceforth according to the man, for thou art a cousin, and, mm -hmm. and she is dying. She is what? And she is dying. She is dying, meaning she is your possession to take care of. Your wife is your possession for you to take care of that possession. You understand? That's what it says. She is dying. She is dying to take care of. Just like she was her father's to take care of, the father was taking care of her. Now she's yours to take care of, just like her father did. Go ahead. And the merciful God give you good success in all things. Because the Lord will give you good success in all things if you keep God's commandments according to what the laws pertaining to marriage and how to take care of my daughter. Read. Then he called his daughter Sarah. Mm -hmm. And she came to her father. And he, he took to care by her. He came to her father because she was still her father's, her father's possession. She belonged to her father before she now going to belong to you. She still belongs to me as her father. Read. And he took her by the hand and gave her to be wife to Tobias. You see that thing? And gave her to be wife to Tobias. Because now Tobias now, because re remember, Reguel is Tobias' father-in-law. Now, guess what he's doing? He's giving the daughter's hand in marriage to Tobias. Okay, go ahead. Say, behold, take her after the law of Moses mm -hmm. and lead her away to thy father. And he blessed her. You see that thing right there? So what we're reading here is 
is the father handing over the responsibility to the husband to take care of the daughter the same way he was doing. You understand? But for the, for the father to do that, the father needs to prove this man for you as a sister. The father, me as a father, my job is to prove this man to make sure that this man right here is going to be able to take care of you just like I was taking care of you. Right? And called Edna, his wife, and took paper and did write an instrument, an instrument of covenant and sealed it. This is a marriage, this is a marriage certificate. So the father will give the daughter's hand in marriage and then the marriage certificate has to be signed to, con to make sure that the marriage is legal, you understand, and is biblical, is ordained of the law. Read. Then they began to eat. Stop right there. They began to what? Then they began to eat. How are they going to eat if when you did not put money away for Lobon? How are they going to eat? Yeah. Hell is you need to put money away for Lobola so that when we meet the uncles, they say, listen, for my daughter, we want X amount of money. They, guess what? You need to be able to we negotiate. We come to an agreement because we're bringing families together. You understand? We're extending families now. After that, we feast. After the marriage certificate is signed, we feast. So if when I, you are a cheap Negro, how are we going to feast? Hmm? How are we going to know that you're going to be able to take care of this, this woman? We know during the feast, or mm, he paid for the lobola, now we feasting. Okay, go ahead. After a girl called his wife Edna and said unto him, Sister, prepare another chamber and mm -hmm. bring her in tea. Prepare another chamber. Guess what? The, a chamber is in the house. That's where you're going to consummate the marriage. Where husband and wife are going to now consummate the marriage, consummate the marriage, they're going to have sex. You understand? Lawful sex according to the laws of God, Hebrews 13 and 4. So during this time, there must be a house for this to take place. The duty of marriage. That's what we're reading here. That's what we read in Exodus 21 verse 10. Go ahead. Which, when she had done as he had bidden, she brought her teeth, and she wept, and she received the tears of her daughter, and said unto her, Read. Be of good comfort, my daughter. The Lord of heaven and earth give thee joy for this thy soul. Be of good comfort, my thought. Okay, chapter 8, verse 1. Watch this. The book of Toby, chapter 8, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And when they had supped, they brought Tobias in unto them. When they had supped, when they had eaten, this is now during the wedding feast. You understand? During the wedding feast, they brought Tobias in unto her into the marriage chamber so they can consummate the marriage during the wedding feast. You see that thing? But remember, the wedding feast requires money. So guess what? The parents are proving you to see if, are you going to be able to take care of our daughter here? You understand? So these are things that the parents are using to see. Or, mm, okay, he's a man of his word. He does what he says he's going to do, so on and so forth. So guess what? You as the, you men, you brothers, you better make sure that you prepare for what we just read. You must prepare for all these things. Because me, I'm not going to go to a wedding feast and guess what? We're eating maguinha. There's no meat. What the hell is this? There's not going to be maguinha on the wedding feast. Understand that. We're not going to be eating the corporate part. That's not happening. Chapter 8, verse 19. Read what you got. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 19. Read. And he kept the wedding feast 14 days. Mm, how many days? 14 days. Because we knew how to party. But the point is, for, for a 14-day wedding feast, guess what? That requires money. So we had money. You understand? But my point is this. We need to, because we are in captivity, we understand that they were also in captivity. The point is this. We need to be able to in, uh, put our money, you put our money to good use. For the benefit of the nation, for the benefit of the congregation, for the benefit of the body, you understand, and to prepare ourselves for the wives that we are going to marry. Understand that. That's what the Lord is actually teaching us. He's, he's teaching us that we must ready ourselves. The same way the sisters must prepare themselves, they must prepare themselves to be a wife. You prepare yourself to be a husband. Don't think it's the only the sister's job to prepare herself to be a wife. No. You prepare yourself to be a husband. 
so that these things, you can be able to provide for these things. You can see, provide food, raiment, a house to cover shame. You must have, a, you must, you must have lobola saved up. You understand? You must have investments and things like that. You must labor, you must have a job. You must understand the scriptures. You must apply. You must have a good report and a good name. These are things that you must have. If you don't have any of these things, you're not ready to talk to no sister. You understand? Don't even say shalom. The hell is this? Now, give me, keep going, read verse 20. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 20. Mm -hmm. For before the days of Mary, Raguel had said unto him by an oath that he should not depart till the 14 days of, of the marriage were expired. So now, but what I want to show you here is, remember, the wedding signifies the marriage. So is the wedding signifies, because the marriage was sealed by the marriage certificate, okay? They went into the wedding chamber. There was a wedding feast to celebrate a marriage. You understand? So the wedding feast is to celebrate the marriage. That's what this is about. You understand? That's why it's talking about marriage now. Why? Because the wedding feast is to signify that marriage. And it was done according to as it is written, according to the scriptures. So what the father did, your job is to take over from the father and be able to take care of the wife. Understand that you cannot be a cheap Negro. Okay. Now, watch this. Let's go to um, what I want to touch on is this, actually. Um, like I said, this class is a prelude to the class that I want to have, you understand, which is a follow-up class to what men want, the order of merit, what men want. This is a prelude to the class that I'm going to deal specifically with the men, okay? We tell you must feed the congregation, which is your wife, which is because your church begins in your house. You feed the church, okay? That's your job. For you to be able to take care of your wife like that, you must be have a job. You must have a job. You understand? You must have a place to stay, okay? You must be able to, um, to manage the basic things in life. You must be able to provide for those things. You must understand the scriptures, okay? You understand? You must have a good name and a good report. That goes into the utterance, the things that come out of your mouth. You understand? Your reasoning must be in the laws of the Most High God because the things you say is the things that you will do according to the scriptures. And the men around you will watch you to see if you indeed doing that, or indeed you 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 are ready to get married. We are going to prove you to make sure of all of that. Understand that. Um, okay, all praises to the most side. So um I'm gonna end the class right here. Okay, I'm going to end the class right here, but I'm gonna talk with the best. Go back to Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians because this class is gonna be continued. Okay, it's a prelude to the class that I really want to go into. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, read verse 25 again. The book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Right. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Right. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Because guess what? The way you are going to cleanse your house, get that in First Timothy, okay? Because remember, Christ, he fed the church, he healed the church. You understand? So read that, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. This is how you're going to cleanse your house. Read that. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Mm -hmm. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? See that thing? If a man know not how to rule his own house, because guess what? The way you clean your house, you rule your house according to the laws of God. Your job is to make sure that you rule your house according to God's commandments. Don't abuse your wife. You love your wife because your wife is your neighbor. So you must love her as you love yourself. The way you clean your house, which is your, the church, which begins in your house, that your, that's your wife and your children that you will eventually have. Guess what? The way you cleanse it, you rule over it with the laws of God. You keep God's commandments. You teach God's commandments. You heal it. Make sure that it's washed by the word of the Most High God. Okay? Now, go back to where it was at Ephesians chapter 5. The book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. 
that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by grace. Go ahead. That he present, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or ring or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So now, guess what? We're going to deal with this in the next class, Lord's will. So now, I'm going to end the class right here. I'm going to end the class right here. Let's break bread in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Okay. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he prayed it and said, Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had sub said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. For, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death to come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord with shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh with, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many speak. In the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. All praises to the Lord. Amen. All praises.